guys um welcome we're on to acts chapter six and seven so thank you for joining me we'll get you into the main there so we can make a start we're just uh getting the context by reading the last of chapter five uh gamaliel has said to the uh the jewish council be careful what you do with these apostles these these men because it's from God, you might be found to be fighting against God himself. Uh, that was his last one. And they agreed with him and when they called for the apostles and beaten them, they still went ahead and beat the apostles. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council. Rejoicing, they were counted worthy to suffer shame his name and daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching jesus as the christ notice they do exactly what they said they would they obey god rather than man and we're living in days where that is starting to be a necessity it used to be that uh, religious worship was a uh, that the freedom to <clears throat> to worship was a giver but unfortunately, that is starting to not be a given. They are starting to ask us to do something that the Bible forbids. And that is to discriminate between two kinds of people. We can't do that. Uh, if it was just for a short time, that would be different. But this so-called is the new normal and and as Christians, we can't do that. Let's read on. <clears throat> Acts chapter 6. Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. It's the Greek-speaking Jews. Because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Now remember the distribution was where people would sell a piece of land, bring the money and place it at the disciples or the apostles feet and that would be distributed we don't know who was doing the distribution um, effectively because that is something that uh, no apostle should be doing that's something that deacon should be doing <clears throat> what we do know is that the greek speaking widows were not receiving any of that Anyway, the, the, so there was, arose a complaint against the Hebrew-speaking ones by the Greek speakers. But then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Serving tables means taking care of the physical things, which again is a deacon's job. Um, and uh, what have I got here? Okay, that has to be dropped down to there. Okay. Um, we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And oh... Oh, that our pastors, our church leaders, would learn some wisdom from this. That our church leaders would steer away from any money things. Let that be done by the deacons. Uh, any maintenance things, let that be done by the, the people um, because they, they should be ministering. Uh, that they would give themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. If that was the case, that our church leaders gave themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word, we would have a powerful, powerful church uh, in this day and age, uh, an, an amazingly powerful church. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And who did they choose? They chose Stephen. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. All of these, going by the names, are 
Greek speakers. They're not the widows because these are males. They chose those seven. So it was ones that they knew would be looking after the Greek speaking widows. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip. Philip went on to preach the word of God in Samaria and a huge revival broke out in Samaria. And we don't know how many thousands came to faith in Christ there. <coughs> and then Philip was called out of there to go and speak to a, an Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch. And tradition holds it that he went back to Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, and brought the gospel to that nation. Uh, anyway, there we go. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they lay hands on them. And some powerful stuff was done by at least the first two of these guys. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. You see what happens when there's unity. Uh, and the, the, God just commands the blessing there. And we could learn something from that also as uh, the, the, the elder generation of mature Christians. We shouldn't be separating um, one, uh, one from another because of minor theological differences. That should not be happening. Absolutely not. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, having fellowship with um, with those who have a different Jesus, or, or those who add to the Scriptures. But if we are one accord, one place, we are believing the Scriptures from cover to cover. We have faith in Christ. We believe that uh, that he's part of the Godhead, as is the Holy Spirit and the Father. Um, and we've got the simple gospel very clear. Then we should be able to work together. Because what did our Savior say? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. We haven't reached the end of the age yet. And the, the Holy Spirit is with us. Jesus is with us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Stephen, full of faith and power, uh, <clears throat> where did we get to? did great wonders and signs. He did great wonders and signs among the people. This is Stephen, one of those who we would call a deacon today. Yes. Now, then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. <clears throat> and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Here's a synagogue of freed men. Uh, that's a great, a great name to have. You know, back in the day, the Freemasons... It took their name because they didn't want to be in bondage to the Roman Catholic Church. At the top end, I think they're both working together now. But the idea of being free is one that appeals to us all. If the Son shall make you free, you are free indeed. But what were these freed men wanting to do? They were wanting to bring disrepute onto Stephen, who was truly free. 
He was truly free. The son had made Stephen free and he was free indeed. So they lied. They got people to lie about him. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Well, we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Stephen hasn't spoken any blasphemy as is seen in his sermon to them in the next chapter. He makes it abundantly clear that he will not speak blasphemous words against Moses or against God because that's what they were, were saying. We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. But let's take a look at chapter 7 of the book of Acts, because these two chapters belong together. They're full of sadness, in a way. Sadness in two, in two ways. Because Stephen's address cuts them to the very heart. And they have an opportunity to repent. You know, when we are cut to the heart, we have an opportunity to repent of our sins. When God speaks to us, and he often does through his word, there, there are good times when we say, Lord, I can see I've, I've, I've been off the rails on that particular area, and I'm coming back to you. You know, that's an opportunity for us to say I was wrong. But... Here the high priest says, are these things so? In other words, are you speaking things against the, the Holy Spirit? I beg your pardon. Are you speaking things against Moses and um, against God? And here he makes it very clear that that's not the case. He says, brethren and fathers, listen. The God of our fathers... The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is modern-day Iraq, where of the Chaldees, that's where, where he was, before he dwelt in Haran. And he said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I'll show you. And he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. God gave him no inheritance in it. Not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. So Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. Remember, Jacob had Leah and Rachel as his two wives and their, their servant girls as his concubines. That's uh, Bilhah and Zilpah. Four wives and he got 12 children by them. Six of them by Leah, two by Rachel, two by Bilhah, and two by Zilpah. Anyway, let's carry on. Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs, and the patriarchs come to Egypt. The pa patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles. 
and gave him favour and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now that summarises 13 years, because it was when Joseph was 17 that he was sold to Egypt, how long he spent in Potiphar's service, we don't know. But it may have been a while, but Potiphar's wife became lustful of Joseph because he was a good-looking boy, and she wanted him to sleep with her. And when he wouldn't, she wrongly accused him before her husband, and he was thrown into prison. So for 13 years in Egypt, some of that time was in Potiphar's house, and some of the time was in prison. How long each one was, we do not know. But Pharaoh had these dreams. Pharaoh's butler and baker had already had their dreams interpreted by Joseph. So the butler said to Pharaoh, I know someone who can interpret your dream. And so Joseph was brought before the Pharaoh and he did interpret the dream and was put in charge of storing up the crops for the seven years of famine that would surely come. And they did. And so seven years after the wonderful crops that they had in Egypt, the time of famine came. Trouble came over. Let's read that. Made him governor of all Egypt and all his house. Now famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him. Seventy-five people. So Jacob went back down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. <laughs> and so the three patriarchs and their wives, well, not uh, Jacob's wife, um, Rachel, but uh, certainly Jacob, and Isaac, and Sarah, and Abraham, and Rebekah, I believe, were all in the same tomb, that cave that had belonged to Hamor. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, until another king arose who did not know Joseph. Very likely, another king from a different line to that of the previous pharaoh. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies. They wanted, he wanted them to throw the boys into the river so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, you might remember that was in a reed basket with a pitch to make it waterproof. Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought her up as, his own, as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. <laughs> And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed, struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me, as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller 
in the land of Midian, where he had two sons, um, Eliezer and Gershom. Gershom, anyway. Eliezer, I'm not sure. When 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush. 40 more years had passed now. He's 80, you understand. Still strong, but he's a shepherd for 40 years. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. He came near because he could see a bush burning but not being consumed. Plenty of flame, but it wasn't crackling, it wasn't burning. The Lord said to him, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them, and now come I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. There's your third 40 years. Yes, this is the Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as is written in the book of the prophets, did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch. Moloch was the abomination, the abominable god of the Amalekites. They, they sacrificed their children, letting them pass through the fire, so to speak, to Moloch. Just a wickedness, absolute wickedness and the star of your god Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Yes, the pattern he had seen in the heavenlies, what we would now call the throne of grace, to which we can come boldly, by the way. Uh, the pattern that he had seen, which of our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God, and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. God said, not you, David, your son will build, him a, will build a house for me. Why? David had spilt too much blood wasn't innocent blood, but he'd spilt too much blood. So Solomon, man of peace, built God the temple. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, earth my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? All right. So he's gone through and he's made it abundantly clear he has not been speaking <coughs> against Moses or against God. These were just lies. He has given a, a very clear sermon which the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jewish leaders could not speak against. 
But now he comes and he says three verses here that absolutely rile them up. And he says to these Jewish leaders, you stiff neck, that's, that's you, you stubborn and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers. Who, you who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Whoa. Now, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now, that can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. In this case, for the majority of them, it was a bad thing. They were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. They didn't take it to heart. Now, we can be cut to the heart too. But when we are cut to the heart, it's got to bring repentance. It, it could have, if they'd allowed themselves to repent, they could have come straight into the fold. Jesus would have forgiven them. But they instead, they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Isn't that something that is just... Here's, here's a man that in the previous chapter worked signs and wonders. We'll have a quick look at that right there in chapter 6. Stephen, full of faith and power, there it is, did great wonders and signs among the people. It never ceases to amaze me that those who... <clears throat> are doing the most and the best for the people of God, or supposedly the people of God, are the ones who are hated the worst. You can see the spirit of Antichrist right there in amongst these Jewish leaders. Clear, clear as a bell. It's the spirit of Satan himself. Jesus said in John 10 verse 10, the thief and he's talking about Satan, doesn't come except for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We can just see the same in our, our leaders, our secular leaders. You know, when they raise the age that you can murder the children in the womb to right up till birth, you can see the spirit of Satan there. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Yes, not only the lives of these little ones, but the lives of the mothers. They are far more likely to commit suicide, to, to, to go into long-term depression if they were only encouraged to have the babies, maybe put them up for adoption if necessary. They, would, they wouldn't be... The number of deaths among these 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 mums would be way way less but as it is our society has sided unfortunately our secular society our secular leaders has sided with satan and you can see it also in um the the youth bill for euthanasia euthanasia should never be administered by doctors in the first place doctors should always be there uh, to heal not to kill if euthanasia, if, if it needed to happen, it doesn't need to happen. Palliative care is amazing these days. Uh, and usually those who are seeking it uh, to be euthanized are those who are in deep depression. And God can take people out of that deep depression. There's no reason that anybody needs to be euthanized. Absolutely not. But you watch, give it a few years. Uh, right now, euthanasia is an option for older people, again, thief coming to steal, kill and destroy. But in a few years down the track, our new religion, cultural Marxism, will say it's your civic duty once you turn 80 or 
whatever the age will be, it's your civic duty to take the pill and move on to the next world. Oh yes, it's it'll be for the greater good. Yeah, absolutely, that's what they'll say. Uh, it's just ironic that uh, right now, for the greater good, we all need to be taking the vaccine. It's just ironic because it's the older people that are at, that are in danger, and it's so called to save them. But the hidden agenda is not to save them at all. It's to destroy them because they've sided on Satan's side. If you're no longer useful to society, they want to move you on and take you out. Uh, that's cultural Marxism for you. Uh, Animal Farm makes it very, uh, very good reading for that. The horse who has worked so hard for so many years when he goes lame and he can't work anymore, well, he's just sent off to the glue factory. Yes, that's uh, that's cultural Marxism. That's our new religion. Shouldn't say it's our new religion, it's not. It's the new religion of the ones who, uh, the elite. It's not even their new religion, I shouldn't say that. The elite are using cultural Marxism for their ends. They, their religion is actually very simply, Luciferianism. They follow Satan. And if you, you ask them, you know, the and I'm talking about uh, uh, the ones higher up in Freemasonry and uh, even in some of the, uh, the so-called Christian uh, places, there's a worship of Satan among the top end. And I'm hoping that people will recognize that what Jesus said is true. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He's the only one who can save us. Um, and a you know, no other religion um, is, is worth anything. Anyway, so here he says they were cut to the heart. See, the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This is, this is even before they stoned him. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes uh, that's the outer garment, so that they can have their arms free and throw rocks uh, in a more efficient way. And the witnesses laid down their, their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And you think, surely God wouldn't forgive someone like that. Who is this young man named Saul? Well, that's, he became the the great Apostle Paul. Oh yes, he meant harm to Christians, very much so. So much so that he had letters from the Jewish leaders uh, and chief priests to go to Damascus and arrest anyone that uh, followed the way, is what they called the Christian way. Right? Uh, to arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem for trial. Oh yes, that was Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not lay this charge. I was beg your pardon. Do not charge them with this sin. That's what Jesus also said on the cross. He said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. A euphemism for dying. Saul, in the meantime, you'll read the next chapter, was threatening all sorts of things against the church, but as he goes to Damascus with these letters from the chief priests and so on, a bright light, brighter than the sun, shines around him. And a voice comes to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Saul had his encounter with the Lord Jesus too. Later than all the other apostles, but he became the great apostle Paul. His encounter with Jesus was on the road to Damascus and he became a changed man. But, yep, how much did the stoning of Stephen move him? We really don't know. But he recognized and he blamed himself for the murder of God's, uh, of the martyr this martyr Stephen, he was there giving his assent to that wicked deed. Well, that takes us, guys, to the end of um, this particular section, Acts chapter 6 and 7. I'm sorry I didn't uh, go with you last week. Um, I was down not very well at all, actually. So I've had a few days in bed. Um, and uh, now I'm back on deck. Hello, Castus. Welcome. Um, and thank you for joining me. I normally am doing these... Um, uh, these streams um, in the morning here in New Zealand. It's now afternoon, and I guess in California, you would be five hours later, perhaps. I would guess it's now 4.54, say five o'clock. It'd be 10 o'clock at night. Would that be correct? Something like that. Um, hey, I'm going to go to Discord. And if you'd like to have a chat, you're very welcome to join me there. Um, I've come to the end of this particular stream, and thank you for joining me this afternoon, at least afternoon here in New Zealand. Um, so I'll end the stream, and I'll, I hope to see you in Discord.